I don't know. Okay, folks. <laughs> Grab a seat. Or stand up because we're getting started. Uh, well, you know, the uh, the Warriors are right over there and the Giants are right over there. <laughs> what um, I have to say is go Celtics. You could all boo. <laughs> <laughs> but the important event in San Francisco today is actually right here this morning. So good morning. Um, I'm Drew Altman from KFF. We are now called KFF. By the way, if you didn't notice, please remember. And so welcome to KFF. It was actually March of um, 2020 when <laughs> I went to Costco and stocked up for what I thought would be a couple of weeks um, away from the office. And we haven't had an event in our uh, Barbara Jordan Conference Center in D.C. Um, or um, here until today. So I just want to say how perfect it is to be able to restart with Dr. Rulensky and the CDC and the CDC Foundation. Um, and... Um, Thank you all for being part of that. And I'll just say, finally, it's been a very long time. I think you know us for, uh, should I put it, um, scrupulous being uh, our scrupulously uh, careful and independent uh, policy analysis and polling and health news coverage. So I just need to acknowledge uh, right off the bat that I am a huge Rochelle Malensky fan. Um, I just am, except for one thing, um, which is that <laughs> I'm from Brookline, Mass., and Dr. Walensky is from uh, Newton, although I think she was born in Peabody, which for those of you who are not from there, it's not Peabody. <laughs> it's Peabody. And I grew up with the orange and black of the Newton Tigers as our larger, much larger rivals. But she made it all up when she threw out, I can't remember, I think it was last season, the first pitch at Fenway Park. <laughs> Which was just so really cool. This is an act that heals in Boston. <laughs> so you all, well, maybe not this second, but you all need to Google it. It's just, you really need to, and it was a great pitch too. You all need to see it. I practiced. Um, I was in government twice, federal and state. I had to say no also a couple of times. And those times that my obligations uh, prevented me uh, from serving around my mind as I introduce Dr. Walensky today, because uh, Dr. Walensky went for it in the middle of what truly has been uh, a national crisis. She had a great job at the best hospital uh, in the world, and she answered the call. I guess I should say that best hospital in the world part softly because UCSF is known for it. <laughs> and it is also exceptional. I got uncharted enough. But when you grow up in Boston, it is the best hospital. It is the best. Um, that, you know, it hasn't been celebrated every minute of every day and that it hasn't been um, absolutely a cakewalk. And that's just a testament to how challenging our world has uh, been. The COVID uh, has been a public health crisis, but it's also been a bit of a crisis for um, public health. Many of you I know follow our COVID vaccine monitor, and I would say tragically, it is tragic to me, um, in our surveys, absolutely the strongest predictor at a level of nothing else is close of whether people get vaccinated or not is just simply whether they're Republican or they're a Democrat, which is obviously a proxy for lots of other stuff that's uh, going on in the country. There's a 30-point difference between Democrats and Republicans and the shares of each group have gotten the bivalent booster. There's a 50-point difference in the shares of the two groups who say they would get an annual uh, uh, COVID vaccine. There's a 48-point difference in trust in the CDC. There's a 61-point difference in trust in Dr. Fauci. All this is fueled by polarization, but it is also fueled by misinformation you know, that the deaths are being exaggerated by the government and also that they're being hidden by the government, which is a neat trick if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> that ivermectin uh, is effective, that you can get uh, COVID by the vaccine and more of these um, myths that I think you're all somewhat familiar with. So as we put it in, I thought, a terrific uh, investigation that our KFF Health News did with the Associated Press, Public health was both underfunded and also under threat. And that's just COVID. 
CDC deals with a whole range of equally challenging health issues, and it does it all over the world. Its mandate takes it absolutely everywhere. Uh, next year, and a uh, big move for us, we plan to add a new program area at KFF that addresses misinformation uh, in health and works on rebuilding trust. This is our first new program area uh, since I established the news service, which was now way back in June of 2009. And you may also hear today about changes at CDC that um, Dr. Walensky is initiating. And, you know, these are changes that uh, will not be simple but have long been needed. Those of us who work with the agency are already starting to see the impact um, of these changes. And I will just say that in stark contrast to making changes at a place like KFF, they're hard because a lot is beyond the CDC director's immediate control, including the agency's statutory mandate and authority, and certainly its uh, funding as well. You will also hear today um, about the CDC Foundation and from Judy Monroe, uh, who's a partner to all of us in the private sector who work on these issues, a really critical organization because it has degrees of freedom that an agency just doesn't have, but also it exercises independent leadership on all of these issues that we work on. So that's important, and we're looking forward to that as well. So finally, I'll just say um, we're just hosts today on behalf of the Bay Area, on behalf of everyone that's um, in this room, the program today is the CDC's and the CDC Foundation's, along with our vice, Senior Vice President, Jen Cates, who runs our Global Health and HIV program, who is her um, self a star who will moderate the program uh, for all of us today. But we begin with uh, remarks this morning from Newton, Massachusetts. Um, and Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> Thank you very much for that warm welcome, this warm introduction. I am really delighted to be here. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. Um, again, honored to be here with the Kaiser Family Foundation and the CDC Foundation and to share the stage with um, with colleagues, with colleagues old and new, with, with dear friends and old friends and so many friends in the audience. Um, in a moment, I will share with you some of our updates of CDC moving forward um, and our agency's priorities, as well as touch on how climate change is affecting public health. But before I do, I want to address the specific audience of public health professionals, of journalists, community partners and more. I share the following information not merely to communicate topical facts, but because each of you possess power to affect change. You are deeply engaged and frankly, we are all in this effort together. So thank you for all that you have done. Thank you all for all that you will accomplish to inform national health issues and policies that shape them. Over the past three years, COVID-19 has tested our public health system, its workers who labor tirelessly to prevent the spread of disease and to save lives. While there were many moments of uncelebrated community and triumph, there were also many challenges that revealed a weakened and frail public health system. The pandemic emphasized the importance of public health, of public health workers, and a system, an infrastructure that supports both. We at CDC have reflected um, on the last three formative years to apply them to lessons that we've learned to move CDC as an agency to be a more modern, responsive, and forward-leaning public health agency of the future. CDC Moving Forward is a strategic initiative we launched in April of last year after an extensive review of the agency with internal voices and external input. CDC Moving Forward addresses long-standing agency-wide challenges which require changes across all of CDC from structure and process to culture and operations. Since I announced this initiative, we've taken multiple steps to address past shortcomings and strengthen the agency's ability to be prepared and respond to future public health threats. 
At the end of last year, I rolled out an agency-wide reorganization that eliminated reporting layers, broke down silos, elevated foundational public health capabilities, and helped improve bi-directional communication and accountability. However, I want to be clear that CDC's Moving Forward initiative will achieve much more than simply moving boxes on an org chart. That organization and reorganization needed to happen, but I am more focused now on our hard work in tackling our processes and our systems and our incentives, our internal incentives. Our goals remain to strengthen the agency and shift our culture so that we can share our scientific data and findings faster, so that we can translate that science into practical, easy to understand policy, so that we can prioritize our public health communications so that we can promote our results-based partnerships, and so that we can develop a workforce that is ready to respond to emergencies. And in many of these areas, we have already identified solutions and implemented change. Scientific review times are down 50% without sacrificing quality, and we are not done. We've prioritized releasing data and new scientific information quickly with multiple technical reports and data releases, including during the MPOX response and the latest update technical report in avian flu. Our CDC website is undergoing an overhaul of over 200,000 web pages <laughs> to streamline the website <laughs> to, to more effective and efficiently share user-focused data-driven content. We've implemented strategies to ensure our entire workforce is ready to respond to future threats, including requiring emergency response training and standing up a roster of staff that are ready to quickly to, depo to deploy into emergency roles, both within the agency and all around the country. There is so much we are doing. In fact, over the last several months, we've identified 161 priority actions in all, and an agency that is now deeply committed and engaged in those activities to improve our accountability, our communication, our collaboration, and our timeliness and partnerships. These are, and many of the other priorities are underway and will lead to an agency that is stronger and better positioned to deliver public health and its mission and to address future public health threats. And while we continue to make strides towards an agency prepared for any future public health threat, we also need you all to know that to fulfill our potential, we also need congressional action and support. Budget flexibility and new authorities would allow us to work faster and be more nimble. It would allow us to fulfill our mission you expect of us, to be an exceptional science-based agency and an exceptional public health response-based agency. To do this, the authorities at CDC needs range from public health and regulatory to human resources and operational, and in most cases will take congressional backing. When faced with seasonal and emerging uh, disease threats, we need to be able to call up comprehensive standardized data from across the country quickly something that we currently do not have the authority to do. During the MPOX response, we were responding with blind spots in our data on how and where disease was spreading, limited by our patchwork system of data use agreements with states and jurisdictions. When faced with critical decisions about MPOX vaccinations, I can tell you where I was as we were making these decisions, we had to go state by state to set up data use agreements to ensure we could get information on who was sick and who was getting vaccinated. Even as a nationwide vaccine strategy unfolded starting in June of 2022, it was not until September that we had established data use agreements with each state to get the information on who was getting vaccinated. When our staff are called upon to respond in emergencies, we don't have some of the flexibilities and resources that other federal response agencies have. When our staff are called to an Ebola treatment unit across the globe, we cannot offer danger pay when they are clearly on the front lines and in harm's way. Remarkably, and this is just a testimony to the people I get the honor of working with, they go anyway speaking about how they feel undervalued. 
We are limited in our ability to, qu to quickly hire surge staff to support work on new disease threats and the huge strain and demand these threats put on an already frail and understaffed public health system. We appreciate the support and help we get from partners like the CDC Foundation. We are so grateful for it. And as I've traveled the country, I've heard time and time again how invaluable the support of the CDC Foundation has been during these times. But we also recognize that not being able to quickly pivot and respond to the most pressing health threats cannot go on. We've learned a lot about recent public health emergencies, and I hope we can come together across the government, industry, and communities to strengthen our nation's health and preparedness for future threats. So I wanna close by pivoting and discussing another more chronic but critical issue, climate change and how it affects public health. Many do not consider that the immediate threat that climate change has on health and that has the potential to be one of the greatest health threats of the 21st century. The impact of climate poses unique risks to people's health and well-being, and again, stories I have heard across the country. The obvious, such as increased risk of respiratory and cardiovascular disease from air pollution or weather-related injuries and deaths. And the less obvious, such as imminent threats to food security, mosquito and waterborne diseases expanding geographically and dramatically across the country and mental health and stress-related disorders. Although everyone is at some risk concerning the health implications of climate change, not everyone faces these risks equally. Communities who are most affected are those that are under-resourced, marginalized, overburdened, and generally, frankly, those who are not the ones most Im implicated in creating the harm. This means that communities of color, as well as tribal and rural communities, are expected to bear the brunt. Addressing the broad scope of health implications from climate change and, multi and, uh, and uh, reaching communities at the greatest risk is critical and will require a multidisciplinary approach. This rapidly progressing threat requires an integrated, cross-sectional approach at CDC and across our entire society. CDC is creating action, uh, taking action by creating tools that all communities can use to combat the adverse effects associated with climate change. CDC plays a leading role as a federal, federal agency on the health implications of climate change with a focus on the preparedness and resilience to protect communities. And we're committed to addressing climate change by continuing to bolster public health capacity, to elevate the voices of trusted messengers, to support long-term solutions in affected communities, to partner with community organizations, faith-based groups, every level of government and across sectors, and to educate the future public health leaders in a science which merits a much more expanded workforce. However, this is not CDC, something CDC can do alone. Public-private partnerships are critical as we are addressing climate change's current and future threats. Everyone has a role to play in preparing for and combating the negative health implications of climate change and promoting equitable preparation for all communities. So as you can see, we have our work cut out for us. It's reassuring to know that the CDC Foundation and the Kaiser Family Foundation share similar values and responsibilities when it comes to realizing the work that we have ahead together. As dedicated public health workers, we must continue to work collaboratively creatively and consistently. And through our combined commitment, we can achieve a better public health reality, one defined by efficiency, readiness, and equity. So thank you again for your time today. I really look forward to our continuing conversations and um, about improving CDC today so that we can transform public health for tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Cates. I'm here at KFF, and I'm thrilled to be able to moderate our discussion. Because this is going to be a discussion or a conversation, it's going to be between Rochelle, Judy, and Jen. And then we're, um, <laughs> uh, that, that's what we're for ourselves. And then we're going to open it up to some Q&A from, from all of you. Um, I was thinking, uh, as you were talking and as Drew was talking, you know, one of the um, new realities that we all find ourselves in prior to COVID, 
I think the average person living in America uh, had no idea of how CDC, you know, what CDC was or CDC's role in their life. Because when there's not a crisis, public health is in the background and, you know, things are com coming along and you don't see all these processes. And then there's a crisis. And so the reality, the, everyone got a sort of front row seat to see what CDC does. And just, I was thinking about your last 24 hours, you were on the Hill testifying about many of these issues and why CDC needs the budget that you're asking for. You last night recommended an updated vaccine schedule for COVID-19. So anyone out there who's 65 or older, immunocompromised, think about getting your booster again. Um, you know, so a lot's going on. Um, and it's just, 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 and those are just the things I read about. I'm sure there is a trash off the, the many fires you're putting out this morning. Um, so big picture stepping back. Uh, I have a question and this could be because I was uh, talking to my kid's teacher, but if you could give a report card on the nation, you know, where we are in terms of COVID now, you know, look, thinking big picture, that's part one. And part two, on where we are as a nation in terms of being prepared for the next pandemic. It, those are big questions, I know, but what, um, how are we doing? Yeah. So, so I mean, I, certainly, I think compared to where we were three years ago, two years ago, a year ago, we are in a far better place when it comes to COVID-19. And that is because of the hard work of testing, vaccination, Paxlovid, we have the tools now that we didn't before. Our um, case rates are harder to follow day by day, but our hospitalization rates are far lower than they have been. Our death rates are still in the 200 a day. And as far as I'm concerned, that remains too high. Um, the character and quality of who is dying is different than it was earlier on. But again, that number is still too high as far as I'm concerned. So I do think we're in a better place. Obviously, the public health emergency is scheduled to come down on May 11th. Um, and um, I think we need to be in a posture of preparedness um, because we don't know, you know, what is to come, but we are in a far better place. And partially because so many people have had some form of vaccination, infection, or some combination that leads to relatively good protection against COVID-19. Um, in terms of the preparedness, we've made huge strides over the last several years. Um, and when I think of sort of our public health preparedness, I really do think of our infrastructure because we really don't know what tomorrow's threat would be. I think if all of us rewound the clock, we wouldn't necessarily have anticipated that the summer 22 threat would be MPOX. Um, and so what that really means in my mind is that we um, have to have a workforce and data systems and laboratory systems that can respond to any public health threat. Um, just to give a sense, and these are data that are, you know, evolving, but prior to the pandemic, there was an antis there was a um, report from that that uh, estimated about 60,000 public health work jo workforce jobs in deficit. There have been other estimates that say that half of public health workers have left during the pandemic. That just gives you a sense of the frailty of the public health workforce that we have. Um, the fact that CDC went into this pandemic receiving data, and this is from 64 states, territories, and big cities, 3,000 tribes, and 507, oh, sorry, 3,000 counties and 574 tribes. Um, and they all come in different ways, different times, different systems, different standardization. Um, that is not an acceptable data system. That got much improved during COVID from um, from the public health emergency, but that's one one infection, right? So what happens when we have to do this for MPOX or when we have to do this for, you know, name your next, you know, scary pathogen? So um, those are the things that we're really working on. And among the things that I testified yesterday for, for the in the budget is to really ensure that we have a um, sustained long-term investments in the public health infrastructure. Supplemental monies will not alone do that. I think people are always shocked when um, they find out that you CDC can't require state and local <laughs> jurisdictions to send data. They just have, they didn't know that. My new favorite line is when you ask for data from CDC, you should always ask, does CDC get the data you're asking? Of course, <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> um, before I ask you some of, some of this, Judy, um, you said something about the public health emergency, which is ending on May 11th. Um, what are, from CDC's perspective, you know, what are some of the implications of that? 
So one of the big things that we're working on is the data issues, right? So with the public health emergency and the sort of long runway that it took to get the data use agreements and sort of some changes that have happened over time in terms of how people are using PCRs versus how they're using antigen tests, there are some data that we're not going to get. Um, and there are some data that we will continue to get. So um, I do believe that from a respiratory virus standpoint, we will have a really good window on how COVID is doing. Um, because we will have systems in place that are actually better than our current surveillance systems for influenza and RSV, and we do that pretty well every year. Um, that said, the public is, has become accustomed to seeing some data from CDC that we will not be able to provide anymore. We will not get case data. Those, the viability of those case data in general is, and, uh, the, um, it is limited at this point. Um, the frequency at which we get hospitalization data may be a little bit less. So, so those are the kinds of things that we are working on. But again, um, not necessarily within CDC's authorities to change. So going to CDC Foundation, um, because one of, and you can talk a little bit about this, but your role is kind of jump in when um, the COVID emergency started, kind of working on trying to fill gaps or innovate and promote. Um, where do you see we, we've come out at this point? Yeah, well, I think it's, first of all, there are silver linings, and there are certainly some positives that came out of, of the pandemic. Uh, but I think we need to go back. If you go back to 2008 and the, the Great Recession, and, and so the numbers, uh, Rochelle, that you were talking about, we, we were in a deficit with workforce in, in this country. And if you don't have workforce and leadership and the skills needed, uh, that's, that's like the fundamental uh, the, thing that you need. So um, so fast forward from 08 to 2018, now we have an opioid crisis. Um, and there was uh, funding that went to CDC that went out to 12 states. 12 states come back to CDC and said, this is great, we're getting the funding, this is a major crisis, but you know, we can't hire, and please send us people. So that was the starting point for the CDC Foundation actually getting into workforce. Uh, we ended up hiring, at that time, about 90 to 100 people. They were CDC Foundation field staff. We managed everything, embedded them in these 12 states. That went really well. We built muscle during that time as an independent nonprofit. We're an operating foundation, so if there are resources and a need, we'll build it because uh, we don't have the restrictions of government, so we can move with this speed and flexibility. Um, and that, that went really well. Fast forward, it was three years ago, I think this month actually, that uh, the health departments were all of a sudden now in crisis. And they, they, they've they got this fast moving, novel coronavirus, I don't know if it had been named, maybe it had been named COVID by that time. Um, and they, they couldn't hire staff. And, and that's the other thing. So public health authority lies at the state level, which you've mentioned, people don't understand that. But the other thing that folks don't understand are all the, and, and across the country, it's so uneven, but hiring authorities, caps on FTEs, even in an emergency, can't hire, don't have the FTE, uh, they can't get the skill set, they can't pay the salaries uh, that, that would attract the, the right uh, talent that you need. So all of these things. So we've then uh, stepped in. And I do want to uh, make sure folks understand that during COVID with this hiring surge that the health departments needed, we hired nationally. So we, CDC Foundations, received some attention for all the hiring we did. We ended up hiring over 4,000 people. They were our found, our CDC Foundation field staff. Uh, that was a stretch from the organization. We, we built a lot of muscle. It banded across. We literally had our staff in every uh, state across the nation. But there were other, like public health institutes, that were doing the same thing on behalf of their state. Like Michigan actually has an institute that was a required, that was created by their legislature. To, to do the same thing, or there were some newer institutes that were doing regional hiring to be able to make sure health firms had had their staff. So to me, we're at the juncture now um, that we've got to modernize not just our data system, we got to modernize how we hire and and get through all these bureaucratic uh, challenges that we have with hiring folks into government uh, uh, positions. And and the crazy part is. The, uh, there was just a report out, 55% of graduates of, of schools of public health would like to work in government because of the mission. They're very mission-driven and they want to do it. It's like 17% of those that actually get jobs and they cite the, the challenges of just having job descriptions, getting through the process, and they end up going elsewhere. Um, so, so we've got a lot to do. So this might not be answerable. This is a data question, so we will need data on this, and I don't think we have it yet, but... Given um, 
the workforce challenges that you both have talked about. We know people have left the field. We know how crushed the public health system became. We also know there were innovations and there were some silver linings. Do you think at this point, uh, the public health infrastructure, local, state, et cetera, across the country is worse off than three years ago? Or is it better? Are we, you know, where are we? Do we have to make up for lots of lost ground? Um, or do we, are we a little bit ahead, but we still have a long way to go? You know, I think we're fragile. We are really, because we have made huge investments. When I think about the data systems that we have invested in, just to give you a sense, prior to the pandemic, we had 187 healthcare facilities that could electronically report data to us, 187 in the country. We're now at 23,000, um, massive improvements, and that's 25%. <laughs> So we have, but but to let go, to have that supplemental funding where we've made so much progress and then have that diminish is going to, so that's that's really where I say we're really in a fragile state. Um, there have been so many, I mean, when you think about the people who were invested in the pandemic to help, those are all people who've bought into the public health mission. Um, and and they are now saying, in, I'm, I'm, was in community-based organization after community, FET, federal FQHD after another, and they can't sustain the funding. So these are people who were, you know, bought onto the mission, but they can't continue the work they're doing because the funding is not there. And so we have this like prepped, primed, ready to go workforce that is slowly trickling away from us um, because we don't have the resources to continue investment. It's certainly something we hear from state and local health officials all the time that they are really facing that cliff and it's presenting a challenge. Um, so that was my my first set of questions around the, the external report card. I want to go to some of what you talked about on a little bit of the CDC's internal report card. You're taking on this huge effort to change uh, an institution that has been hard to change. Um, where are, how do you feel that, I mean, there's some of it as you mentioned, or a lot of it is out of your control. And then there's the things that are in control. What is, where, are you, where is the report card on that? How are we doing? Um, so we did this review starting in, in April, started talking to people and did a, a whole comprehensive review. Um, that report came out in August, the reorg by the end of the year. But the, and the reorg I said is really part of it. Like the fact that some of our core capabilities within CDC lie, were lying down numerous layers of bureaucracy made it really hard to really see what was going on. So that was, I call it necessary, but not sufficient. The, um, the sort of work that we're doing in CDC moving forward, um, I'm really energized. Um, we're probably too early in the semester for midterm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say that like what I can see now is the success, the successes that we've been already able to deliver, that we were the first in the world to report on Genio's performance. Um, when other countries were so far ahead of us in being able to do that in COVID-19, we put it online and then we put the published report out. It merits peer review, but we knew the answer before the peer review was happening, right? Um, the the fact that we had four MPOX, work, four MPOX technical reports, the technical report I said on avian flu, people are understanding the import in an era of preprints to get science out faster. And we're starting to see our ability to do that. And people are energized because we're getting we're getting good feedback on that. Um, communications, we just had a, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a whole discussion about how do we preempt what we anticipate um, might be a mis and disinformation if an event were to happen. And can we think about we think we know in a week that this is going to get released. What is the pre bunking that we can do? How do we set the stage to say, and so we're doing a lot of that work and we're actually seeing the successes of that. So I think that as the agency is starting to see that as part of CDC moving forward, we're getting, we, we don't want to be in the news about CDC itself. We want to be in the news about the public health threats that are out there. And more and more over the last several months, that's, that's what we've seen. Right. Judy, I wanted to, speaking of some of the uh, internal things are changing. One is data modernization. And I know that you've done a lot in that area from CDC's foundation's perspective. Can you share how that, what you're doing to try to promote that, to get the, uh, what, 23,000 now are sharing, but that's only a 25% of the... So I do want to give, I'm, I'm going to give you a grade 
Um, my observation is you're attracting really good students if, if, if we're going with the school coming into CDC, and Dana is one of those. Uh, there are some really top-notch folks that have answered the call uh, to come to CDC to work on data modernization. Um, when we think about data, you know, simply, we just need data in public health that moves faster than the seas, right? A lot of people have said that. That's what we need. Uh, being here in the Bay Area, I have to tell you, um, there's a whole lot of really interesting innovation, a lot of high tech. Um, so imagine, you know, the fax machine, uh, we, we were saying data to CDC through fax machines for some of those, those data sources. And so we have, you know, you're left for me to turn out my other way, nothing. But it's in the reality, and the hands, now you're doing data entry, right, instead of data analysis, and you can't take data for action if, if you're backlogged all this, right? So the data modernization um, is, is very exciting. Uh, one of the, the roles of the CDC Foundation has been playing, um, and it played out uh, at the end of February. We were in D.C. We convened um, industry days and, and bringing together CDC, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator at HHS, um, and industry partners, uh, and set the, the stage for them to come together to create a vision going forward together. Uh, but you know, when I think about the vision, again, being here in the Bay Area, Imagine all the data out there, if you had an app that you could check and shade to see what the infectious disease risk is in your community. What if you had an app that you're working on programs like trying to decrease diabetes and you've got real-time data in your community, are you making inroads or not, right? That happens and we, y'all don't do a roll, you know, you don't use the old rotary phone to call a taxi anymore. And, and look what happens when you call a ride share. I mean, not only do you get the ride, but you've got visualization, you've got a map, you see where the car is, you know the name of the driver, you know their license plate, and then they've added all the security. I don't know if y'all have been stuck in a, an Uber lately. I got stuck, and we'd sat and, you know, just stopped traffic next to me. I know I'm getting, are you okay? And then I didn't, you know, I didn't pity. I didn't know what it was, and additionally, I didn't get an alert. Two minutes later, the driver, are you okay? Wow. <laughs> is he? Yeah, who's the perpetrator if there's a risk, right? That's the power of today's technology that needs to be harnessed for public health so that we can move as faster than, than, than the pathogens and the cities. And that's really the aim of this is to unlock that potential uh, for public health. You didn't even mention that you can also get your food delivered that way and, and, a, and a, a COVID test. So, <laughs> I mean, no, it's happening. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we have time for a couple more of our questions before we get to you. So type, tee them up in your minds. Um, we'll come to the audience soon. Um, I wanted to step back a little bit about some, something Drew alluded to in his remarks around vaccination, not just vaccination for COVID, but we're, you know, we're concerned and we've seen this in our polling and I know you are concerned that vaccination as a, a, a measure has taken a hit and it's going to um, be a, really challenging to promote vaccination for routine vaccinations in, in this country. So and, and that connects to this issue of trust in public health and trust in data. So I'm curious, both of your, your thoughts on that. Um, and then a related piece that's, because I forgot to mention another thing you were working on this week, uh, announcing a new vaccines, uh, COVID vaccine program for uninsured adults. Um, so I'll leave it to both of you to take those <laughs> on, but uh, starting with just this issue of routine vaccination and, and kind of the threat to how people see that in our lives. I'm ready to jump in quick on that part. Um, I'm really passionate about this topic. And you may have seen UNICEF, I think, just yesterday put out a report worldwide, uh, the the uh, distrust in childhood vaccinations. This is tragic. We have got, and we've got to approach this very differently. Uh, my mother had polio. So I grew up, you know, hearing those stories, right? It practicing medicine, uh, homophilus influenza B. I remember four plus sick kids coming in every night in the ER. That vaccine hit. Boom, it went away, right? But the parents today haven't seen that. And then we've obviously, communications are very different. So um, uh, we are going to have to have the best and brightest lines around this issue of, of being able to build. And I do think our community-based organizations and the partnership between public health and community-based organizations is super important too for those on the ground, friends and family that are that can be trusted and, and trust is the issue. It's not the technology, we've got better technology than ever. It's trust. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> um, 
first, let me say yesterday. Yes. Yeah, so we had this, you know, vaccination for the uninsured for COVID. There are 13 uh, a- um, ACIP CDC recommended vaccines for adults. Um, and there is no coverage for them uninsured at, for any of them. So this would cover COVID for the short term, but not necessarily for the long term. And we need a bigger, we need a bigger solution. Um, you can't get a shingles vaccine. You can't get a pneumococcal vaccine. All of those things that we recommend are not covered if you're uninsured. In this, in this country, we have a vaccines for children's program that does cover the uninsured. We've had it since 1994. It saved trillions of dollars and over a million lives. We need a parallel program. It was in the fiscal year 23 budget. I just advocated for it again yesterday in the 24 budget, but that would solve that problem. Um, so that is something that we are really advocating for. In terms of the kids, this is a huge, this is going to be a huge challenge. We had a um, MMWR that came out a couple months ago that showed in the last, last year we lost 1% of kindergartners who were fully vaccinated or who were, had all routine vaccines coming into kindergarten. The year prior, we lost 1%. That's a quarter million kids entering kindergarten who are not vaccinated for routine vaccines. And we think we've actually lost some kindergartners too, that they are doing more homeschooling. So that would actually likely mean less kids. Um, As we've talked to states, one of the real challenges is as we're trying to push other policies, well, don't push that one because they're threatening our vaccines. Um, our incoming childhood vaccines into kindergarten. So, so not only are we actually seeing the manifestations of it in the data and on, and you know, and a case of polio in this country, and a measles outbreak in Ohio, there is some product of our own success, right? Um, I when I talked to my parents, you know, about what happened when polio vaccine was first, they were scared. Right, that's what happened. Um, and we haven't seen that fear. People have not had all of these infectious threats touch them to recognize that fear. And I think that's one of the challenges. It's, it is because we're so successful, but that is one of the challenges. So I think, I'm looking at my clock, I think we're, we're ready. We can kind of move into a, a questions from all of you. And people are going to magically come around and have microphones. Um, <laughs> and what we're gonna do is take three questions at a time. Um, so please raise your hand, say who you are, and give us your question. And I'm also going to be looking, we have some press questions that may be coming in, so I'm going to be somehow getting them on this. <laughs> Bear with me there, too. Okay. Yeah. There. Should I start? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Barbara Handelin. Um, I'm here uh, as the founder of a new uh, nonprofit called the 9010 Institute. We're looking to... Um, solve the problem of why we don't have treatments, vaccines, diagnostics for 90% of all human diseases. I'm not gonna, that's not my question. My question um, is, uh, I actually come out of the molecular diagnostics industry and um, then one of the first licensors, PCR, back in the 80s, and um, I am wondering whether there is any role that the CDC can play in cultivating a preparedness on the diagnostics front um, for the future emergent infectious disease. If you can't pick it up and know what and know that people are infected, you're pretty much you know you you are where we are with COVID. We could have had an excellent, rapid, easily deployable test for COVID-19 within months of the outbreak. Had we had a different national policy, financing, and cultivation of preparedness on on diagnostics. Next question. Hi, Mark Zito. I'm here with uh, Real Medicine Media, which is a nonprofit that uses uh, cinematic storytelling and film to change end of life care in America. My question is about behavior change. I know that the that CDC and the foundation have terrific uh, scientific experts in terms of research and data and so forth. And of course, uh, part of what CDC I assume, wants to have happen is to change behavior among the public. And there's a, been a big body of science, of course, in the last 10, 15 years about incentives and nudges and things like that. So I'm just curious about to what degree do you have, do you incorporate the behavior change science into what you do, and do you have the same kinds of uh, um, expert resources there as you do for the other pieces of your work? Okay, and our last question from this round. 
Good morning, Marange Matthews with the Public Health Institute. Thank you for your vision and your stamina. Um, my question is, um, given the work on data modernization, do you uh, currently have at least all 50 states for data uh, use agreements and sharing of data? Have all states said yes now? So with that, start with, start with that one. There was a question about diagnostic preparedness and a question about behavior change. So, okay. yeah. um, so, so we are working on it. Um, there is one state that we may not be able to uh, get those after the public health emergency for legal reasons. Again, every single one of these is um, mired in legal <laughs> issues, um, but we, we are almost there. We are almost there for COVID. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Just to be clear. Um, uh, from a preparedness and a laboratory, this is actually one of the things that we've been focusing. Obviously, the laboratory has been, uh, you know, one of the big challenges and one of the things that we're actively focused on. As part of our reorganization, we moved our, our laboratory, um, our office of laboratory science, so that it now reports directly into the office of the immediate office of the director. Um, we are looking at sort of what a laboratory pipeline would look like. What are the high consequence pathogens? Do we have a lab test that is ready to go? Um, and importantly, this can't just be CDC. CDC has a really important piece of this, but I think we really need to recognize once that lab is ready to go, does FDA, do we have primers and validation? Where is FDA on, on sort of the, the regulatory piece of that? How do we deploy that to lo local and state our um, laboratory network in our local and state public health departments? And then when we need a million a day, how do we work closely with the commercial lab so they're incentivized to sort of say we're going to pick this up this you know there's been a lot of comparisons about what happened with the mpox lab versus what uh, the lab test versus what happened with COVID, and they were actually remarkably different and i would say we had a lab, a lab test for mpox because of years of research at the cdc um one of the and we actually worked really quickly with the commercial labs to scale it up one of the real challenges is that clinicians had never seen it and so we actually, there is no, I call it the um, amber alert for clinicians to sort of say, there's this new thing out there. You've never seen it. You don't know the right questions to ask. This is how you send the swab. Um, and so we actually have a lot of work to do across all of our sectors to sort of figure out how we right size a new a lab test for a new infectious threat. Um, Behavior change. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah, and the behavior change is an excellent question, and I. So the short answer is yes. There's some, not nearly enough. I, there, we need to be more expertise. I think, uh, both both within CDC and and the purpose of the foundation. So. And I think from like the implementation science space, we do have a lot of that work happening. And part of what I was getting at with sort of we need science, and then we need policies that can be implementable on the ground. I've gotten a lot of incoming over the last three years about like, why'd you do this? You should have done that. <laughs> I get a few of those. And you know, one of the questions was, well, why in your COVID-19 community levels did you not use wastewater? We're doing a lot of work in wastewater. And one of the issues is um, there are no sewer sheds in Alaska. We can't use wastewater in Alaska. So, so like, what is implementable in Alaska and Tribal Nation and Guam and Manhattan and Southern Texas, right? And and how we implement is very much based on behaviors in those areas, which vary widely. Um, so we have a lot of work that really we need to do on the implementation science. And then, if you only have one guidance, where do you land on something that's implementable in New York or something that's implementable in Navajo Nation? Um, we can go to the next round of questions. And also just for those who are watching remotely, if you do have a question, it's ask at kff.org. Uh, Dr. Celine Gallander with KFF and CBS News. Um, the, the HHS has a bipartisan uh, or plan for, with bipartisan support for eliminating HIV in this country. We've now seen some setbacks with the federal court decision um, at, with respect to ACA um, uh, Affordable Care Act coverage of uh, preventive services, and then Gilead, uh, their patient assistance program is ending with respect to coverage for or support for PrEP. With these new gaps in access, what is that going to mean for achieving the targets that have been set for eliminating HIV in this country? Thank you. Something near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, um, and, our, and we just will pick up. A oh, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
which is great you asked that because I was on my list to ask if yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, uh, the, Blythe Adamson uh, from Infectious Economics and Flatiron Health. Uh, my question is related to health economics. So one, as a big fan of your work in, uh, in HIV treatment cost effectiveness, I was so excited for you to come and um, bring uh, the the value of that discipline to CDC. One of the challenges that we saw during COVID was that many public health, um, much of our public health workforce wasn't trained in how to estimate the costs of some of the policies that were recommended. And so how do you see um, which parts of CDC are needed to level up in skills and understanding to better be able to negotiate with partners outside of health, like economists or you know the other sectors that are influenced when there's spillover effect and cost consequences of policy? Our last question for this round. Excuse me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Keller. Um, I'm a political scientist at UC Berkeley School of Public Health, and I study pandemic response. Um, uh, one of the things that I've been really curious about is, or watching, I guess, is seeing what I would call, characterize as a public that's sort of intolerant of learning during a pandemic. And when I, I see, certainly I, I'm a huge fan of the idea that we need data, mod data modernization, and that's going to increase the pace of learning, but sometimes the reduction of uncertainty in science is non-monotonic, which would simply lead to faster reversals, um, which might, again, reduce the public tolerance for learning. So I'm wondering how much, um, if there's sort of an equivalent sense of, of thinking about what do we do to, to make sure the public understands that we can't know everything at the beginning and that we're, and that we're doing the best we can and we're coping as we go. Thank you. Great. So we have the PrEP HIV question health economics and the last one, which I think about a lot, that we, we are so low to communicate uncertainty mm -hmm. and that we don't know things, but we have to find ways to do that. So maybe I'll loop those last two because so much of decision science and cost effectiveness is quantifying your uncertainty um, and managing that uncertainty. What do you do with that uncertainty? And in fact, there are certain things where the uncertainty doesn't matter for the question at hand. And so we have to be comfortable recognizing, well, maybe I don't necessarily care about X because X could be a very wide parameter and, and it won't matter. But but I think the public is really intolerant of uncertainty. Um, and um, one of the things that I, you know, the lessons learned for me in all of this, and I've said this before, is I, I've always said we're going to lead these decisions with science. That in my mind always said the science was going to change. Um, the, to the public, that does wasn't obvious, right? Um, we all knew that we were going to learn, you know, we were going to learn more from 20, March of 2020 um, over time and that as we, we would update over time. The other thing I think that's really a challenge is there could be 10 places where we might put out a new guidance or might, might have a new area and nine, there's agreement. Um, the 10th is what makes it to the news. <laughs> Right. And so all of that areas of dissecting the disagreement, um, which often happens in an academic setting or often happens in a in a um, society conference where you have a pro and con on what should we do about X, that's now in a two minute news spot. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a public that is really grounded and wanting to know, you know, what should I do? They're not focusing on the nine of 10 things. They're focusing on that one, which really makes it hard to for the public to digest. We did actually just last month at CDC have a, a seminar on decision science. And part of what that, and that is sort of the field of simulation and cost effectiveness and how we manage uncertainty. The second, the, the second, I'm a decision science person, the second chapter in the book is, and the most used book is managing uncertainty. What do you do with the fact that we may not have the, the data points for all of these questions? And to have the agency recognize um, that we there may be things that are not as efficient as they were a while ago. There may be systems that we're using now that we we have one that we're using now that um, may not be as efficient. We got the information that we needed from said system, so it's time to sunset that. That's hard. Um, but I think people are starting to sort of realize that we are we don't actually need the data point to the um, hundredth decimal point. What we really need is to say, it's low enough that we should move forward. Or, um, so that's a lot of the work of decision science. And, and we had a really productive scientific seminar on this with all of our senior leaders and real enthusiasm on the, using those kinds of methods to make decisions. 
with regard to HIV, I mean, I'm friends with so many people in this room because of a long career with many of you in this. Um, the, you know, clearly the beauty of this is that it's bipartisan. It started bipartisan in both, both administrations, last one and this one. On the Hill yesterday, it is part of our fiscal year 24 budget to to continue the, the hard efforts in funding 57 jurisdictions that are 50% increased risk of um, our highest rates of HIV. Um, and yet we are getting, as you know, local policies, legal decisions that are threatening that even in this bipartisan way. Um, we are working hard to um, to counter those to the extent that we can, to the extent that we have the authorities. Ultimately, I think we all need to recognize that if there is a partisan maneuver to um, limit access to to um, resources to prevent um, public health and health care, that it is the people of that state that are hurting. Um, and so, so that's a lot of the work that we're doing as we start to counter some of these challenges. Do you want to add anything, June? Yeah, um, well said. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. I have one. Um, hi, Ms. Pumela, UCSF. Um, given the political interference we saw in this country in the past administration and in so many other countries, is there a way to protect CDC by giving it larger degrees of freedom, hopefully a Federal Reserve kind of... Uh, independence. That's one. Second question is about um, um, global health security looking at uh, Latin America. Uh, as we all know, it is a region of the world that had the largest impact on COVID deaths. With only 8% of the population, it had one-third of the COVID deaths. It's a region that has originated or amplified pandemics. Think of cholera in 1991, think of uh, H1N1 uh, 2009, think of Zika, Chikungunya, and now H5N1. Um, is there something that we could do more uh, proactively with uh, universities or governments, public health institutions in the region so that we can think of um, a global health hemispheric protection. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Should I stand up? Judy Alabad from UCSF and an independent consultant who works a lot with government and nonprofits and a sociologist. So kind of connecting some dots that I think I've heard from folks talking about social and behavioral science questions. It seems to me that what is really needed is some very concerted effort around that what we in sociology call the public understanding of science. And we've talked about pieces of that, but there doesn't seem to be a very concerted campaign, which is why I'm looking at you, Judy, from the CDC Foundation, that goes beyond CDC for sure and would connect the NIH, but also the National Academies of Science or OSTP in the White House, things like that, where the object is really about allowing, enabling, facilitating the American public in particular to be educated about science and to understand how people understand science, because that's really what fundamentally has affected us, certainly in COVID and well in climate change, which is now you know a big priority for you, Rochelle, at CDC. We may be able to get ahead a little bit in front on climate change. We've lost a bit with infectious diseases, but I think we could still reclaim. So I'm wondering if you're aware of something or if you've thought about working with some of these other science bodies and other stakeholders to really create and engaging a social behavioral scientist to know this stuff, um, not just communications, not just decision science, uh, but to really develop a very concerted program and campaign around the public understanding of science, how people understand scientific phenomenon, processes, uncertainty, all of those elements, absorb them in their everyday life, and then re uh, kind of affect the science. Okay, last question. And then we're really we're out of time with our answers. So, hi, Rachel Witt from Blue Shield of California Foundation. I wondered if you could speak about the CDC's role in addressing the root causes of racial and ethnic health disparities and the experiences of other marginalized groups who we know were devastated by the COVID pandemic, and so much of that relates to those those underlying root causes. 
Okay, so the recap, we have one on protecting CDC and making it maybe more independent. I can already say the answer is probably not much to do down there. <laughs> a lot in America and global health security, um, and then public understanding of science and uh, equity work at CDC. You want to start with? No, so let me start with your question, um, because that's you're hitting on something that we're thinking a lot about at the foundation and, and other partners are as well. But what you described, I do not know of, of that type of campaign and, and how exactly you know, you'd go about it. I will say at the foundation that we have, I have a few board members and new board member in, in the room here. So I, hopefully they're taking notes as well, because communications is one of the priorities that we set at the CDC foundation for exactly the reasons you're, you're outlining the, the mistrust, distrust, but this understanding of science. And, and so forth. So I'd love to talk later about this because we, we're on a jury. Um, we'd love to activate. Yes. <laughs> um, to address some of the other issues, you know, um, yes, I think that we, it would certainly be better to have an independent, well, I'm, to have, it would be a different, different place to have an independent health agency. I will say as I've, um, as I've been in this role, one of the things that we also really need to recognize is the whole interagency USG health has to have a seat at the table, but it can't have the only seat at the table. And as we've had discussions and so much of the work that we do at the policy level has to have the Department of Ed and has to have labor and has to have it. If we are so monocular as to only look at health then we're not looking at the economic impacts, which potentially downstream could lead to worse health outcomes. So we really do need to be able to see the whole picture. I don't think we're moving in a direction that that you're talking about. The 20 January 2025 CDC director, whoever that may be, will be Senate confirmed. I was not. Um, so policies are not moving in that direction, um, unfortunately. Um, I will, uh, I, I do want to take a minute to sort of highlight what I think is um, a, a jewel of the CDC that it, people do not recognize, and that is our global work. So thank you for being able to say that, uh, or letting me speak to that. Um, I, I, I hear about outbreaks all over the world, and my team is there. We are in 60 different countries. I am now getting briefed at least twice a week on the Marburg outbreak, both in Tanzania and in Equatorial Guinea. We have dozens of people on the ground doing that work. Um, it is a global health security issue. It is, um, it is the case that almost every new variant of COVID was not homegrown. It came out from elsewhere. It is the case that, you know, last year while we were tackling MPOX in this country, we were also tackling a um, Sudan Ebola outbreak in Uganda where we had um, people on the ground doing really hard work. So I do think um, that is really under-recognized, under-appreciated, um, the work that we do. I think I have over 1,500 people who are working abroad at any given time um, to be able to protect the global health security, both in country, but also, um, also obviously for the United States. Um, the, the social determinants of health and the sort of root causes, as I think people know, in April of 2021, one of my first actions was to declare racism a serious public health threat. I think one of the most, I, I, this is sort of from my perch, but, but one of the most um, mobilizing things that I did as um, director early on was to ask the agency to look at what they were doing in their divisions and their branches to address racism and and um, and race and ethnicity issues related to health. And I said, in each of your places, I would like you to not document the problem anymore. What are you going to do to actually address what we know is a problem every time we look? So we need to, and, and we came up with hundreds of different things, full light supplementation on tribal nations and hear her campaigns and tribal nations. And to really, certainly we need to document so we know that whether these things are working, but documenting the problem is not an endpoint; It's a starting point. And so I really, um, and it's been really energizing for people to come together just at a time when they were pretty well spent to say, we are actually going to do these things. I, I, I have said you know, COVID-19 hit our shores by people who could afford to fly and could afford to be on cruises. And quickly, it went to people who couldn't. And we know that in all infectious diseases. Um, but but it, it's been really mobilizing and energizing for the people of the agency to start addressing, you know, what is it that we could actually do in our communities to make a difference? Um, 
the other thing from a data modernization, and we've talked, and I, I do want to sort of uh, reiterate what Judy has said with the foundation support, we have been getting some exceptional talent coming in to be able to do our data, help with our data modernization efforts and industry days. People are now really committed to, to this mission. I think about our data highways as our public health data. Um, however, what about our housing data and how is that going to intersect? And what about our social mobility data and how is that going to intersect? And what about our labor data? And once we actually get to that level, then we can start addressing our social determinants of health. Who is living in a place with greenery? Where is it that they are getting their education? Um, where is it? How is it that they transmit to work? What is their work? That's the level of data I think that will really, when we get these modernization efforts, you know, truly um, to a place they need to be, that we can add that layer and actually have a much better view. It, because we are over time and because I love that we could end up that concept of addressing the social determinants and equity, which is so important to the work we do at KFF as well. I think we should end there. I know there's more questions, um, but also I want to say thank you to both of you, to Judy and to Rochelle and the work you're doing, but also thank you for taking on this job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to everybody for thank thanks for being here um, today. We really appreciate it, and we're back in business having events. So. <laughs> 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 I'm going to read the certain